A victory lap, 50 years in the making. What went right, what went wrong, and what about the lessons for next year's Super Bowl parade? Plus, we connect the dots for you on the rest of the week's top local news stories and newsmakers. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marley Scorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. It was an historic week in so many ways, and here to help write the first draft of that history, fresh from wall-to-wall -wall parade coverage, 41 Action News reporter Kat Reed, wearing out a good pair of shoes to track what happened on Celebration Day downtown, nationally syndicated columnist Mary Sanchez with the Tribune News Service, keeping you up to date weekdays at 11 on KCUR FM, Steve Kraske, and from the pages of your Kansas City star, Dave Helling. A threat of snow and biting cold does not stop hundreds of thousands of Chiefs fans this week from converging on downtown Kansas City to celebrate the team's first Super Bowl win in half a century. What went right, what went wrong, and what about the lessons for next year's Super Bowl parade? Let's start with a fill-in-the-blank question. The most jubilant moment for me, Kat Reed, during mm -hmm. this week's Super Bowl parade in Kansas City was blank. You know, I think for me it was when the players got off the buses and took to the streets, when you had Reggie Ragland, Tyron Matthew, um, just walking and wanting to greet fans. It just really made it feel like this was our win, too, and that was a really special moment. A lot of people complained about that, though, because they then couldn't <laughs> see them because they weren't elevated. True. Fair enough. Mary. People said that actually where I was, which was across from the Sprint Center, but it with the players' jubilation and just the fact that you had this vision of them as they're young men. They're young yes. men celebrating together. You could tell there are true friendships on that team. I just loved it. I mean, even the parts that probably annoyed some people, the chugging of the beers, it was they were wonderful to watch together. Steve. Well, let me take a different tact here. I thought the police stopping yes. the driver racing down uh, Grand Boulevard was uh, a terrific moment. I mean, this parade yeah. could have gone south and made national headlines for all the wrong reasons, Nick. It just with a few different decisions that might have been made if police had begun to fire in that car, if that car had oh, wow. veered into the crowd in some way. We, that parade could have been given uh, Kansas City a black eye for a long time to come. The police get a lot of criticism, sometimes just justifiably, but boy, this time they came through big time, Nick. The big moment for me was when the players and the other team officials held up the trophy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure I was not alone in thinking, gosh, I hope they don't drop that thing, you know, I mean, because it's kind of slippery, it's whatever it's made out of. But that was really a symbolic moment, don't you think, that this is what we've waited 50 years to see in our hands? And that uh, seemed to me the yes. most celebratory uh, part of the parade. It would have been very upsetting to me, Dave, if I if somebody accidentally tipped beer on the on the trophy, for instance. <laughs> I'm They've sure a, a, that, a little though. beer actually did get <laughs> okay. uh, on the trophy. Yes, I, 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 absolutely <laughs> was, which and, some and people got kind of, offended by too. Yeah, you had them and, all and drinking beer yeah. on the on the buses. Yeah, back when, to, when the people who go into the go into the parade were told not to, to have drink. It. Yeah. Um, also, the Lombardi Trophy is, I must say, much more impressive than the World Series trophy, which you can't drink anything out of. <laughs> bunch of flags, so that was a neat part for me. Of course, every event has the good, the bad, and the ugly. What was the part of this parade we prefer to forget? Steve mentioned, for instance, the scene of a car breaking through the barriers along the parade route before it began, barreling at speeds of up to 60 miles an hour before being stopped by police. But Steve, you said that was actually a positive part, that's showing the police responding. So what was the downside to this parade? Well, you know, I, I think that moment probably ranks as, as the downside for, for a lot of people. You know, not to stick my foot in the proverbial uh, punch bowl here, but, you know, pouring beers from the top of the bus into the Chiefs player's mouth with lots of little kids watching. You know, hey, it was fun. It was great. I get all that. But you sort of wondered a couple times if, if it was getting a little, little crazy. Mary. I was okay with that, but I understand yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, I understand yeah. that perspective because I, I just think some other things overwhelmed it as well. Sure. Um, you know, it is just a harsh reminder of the society that we live in that the police literally have already said, you know, it went through our minds this is a terrorist attack. It was an idiot who was high, but that could have been awful. The one thing, though, Boy. to jump on what Steve said as well, it was wonderful that it was interjurisdictional. 
you know, it was an Independence police officer who jumped in a KCPD car. It was the Clay County Sheriff's deputy who threw down the stop sticks. That sort of ability to work together doesn't always happen, Great but their point. best training, best instincts kicked in. It was amazing. Kat. You know, and we had a couple minor mishaps. There were five arrests uh, during the parade. We had a gentleman, a video that was all over. We could not show it on television, but a gentleman falling from a tree who had had a little bit too much to drink. Lots of people climbing in the trees. Um, there was also a man um, who rode his horse down to the parade and uh, was <laughs> dancing on his horse's back in the middle of a crowd, and he was later um, arrested. He wasn't charged with anything, but there were a, a couple mishaps. You know, but last week uh, we showed ugly scenes from Philadelphia immediately after the Eagles won the Super Bowl in 2018. Should we feel relieved, Dave, that we were spared all of that mayhem and destruction? Yeah, here? No, Kansas City should be proud of itself. We've waited half a century <laughs> to win this game. And, and uh, you know, there was, I think, an unfortunate incident with a firework which took a life. And that's something you would worry about. That and was after the uh, Super Bowl after itself. After the Super yeah. Bowl itself. And there were lots of fireworks that night, I must say, even in my neighborhood out in Lenexa. So, but no, I think the behavior was relatively peaceful and, and calm and, you know, take pride in that. I think Kansas City deserves a huge clap on the back for the way this thing unfolded and people largely behaving themselves, keeping themselves within uh, reason here. And look at that video from Philadelphia, Nick. I mean, we didn't see that in Kansas City for the most part, and that's something to be very the, happy about. The parade about. brought about lots of questions from our viewers, but I was interested in this one because it came up from a number of people, KCB TV, uh, Brian and Lee Summit asking, uh, who actually pays for the parade? Does the NFL help with the costs of putting on the event? So it's a traditionally a mix of taxpayers, team, and then also corporate sponsors can um, also chip in. The Royals parade, uh, the tab was $350,000, and that was largely picked up by corporate sponsors. But with the Super Bowl parade, we've seen them range from six figures all the way up to $3 million. So it'll be very interesting to see how much this costs in the end, especially you have to take into consideration the staffing of first yeah, responders. Did, if you saw the, the, the double-decker buses going by on the sides, you saw various sponsors plastered, you know, Community America Bank and some others. That was not free. <laughs> and that's how the chiefs defray some of their costs. And then the cost for the locality in terms of providing police. Uh, and chiefs coach Andy Reid said during the parade, you know, look forward to seeing you again at the same time, same place uh, next year. What should parade organizers do differently if there's going to be a parade uh, next year at the same time, if at all? Well, I think, again, they did a lot of things right, Nick, and they learned from the Royals' experience. The one thing that really caught my eye was the, were these stations that were set up in case parents got separated from their kids, in case you are reported, that that uh, happened about eight times, kids mm -hmm. getting separated, but quickly being reunited. Very smart thing to have, uh, take, ha have had taken care of, and yes. smart move. They also did far more portable toilets and far more buses to get people effortlessly Free buses. to and from. The, the actual parade itself, which was a difference from the last time around. But what lessons would they still want to learn if they're going to do it again next year? Well, I, I think that they would probably do the same thing with the buses. They moved 20,000 people from Oak Park Mall, and the average wait time, I think, at its peak was about 20 minutes, whereas with the Royals Parade, we were talking, like, hours, yeah. almost, up to an hour wait. So I think that was a huge lesson, that lesson and it will be repeated for the next one. Mary. You can't control the weather, and I do think this was a large part of it. But some of the other restaurants and just vendors within the area did say that the crowds dissipated fairly quickly. And there wasn't that sort of long-term like money going into commerce, into the area businesses as much as they would have liked. Yeah which I don't know how you monitor that with the, the cold. I think people just wanted to get home. Yeah. You know, I also I know that it's a very fast turnaround to put that kind of parade together, but it would have been great if there could have been more elements in it. Um, not dancing clowns, but you know, we, you know, the schools yeah. were well, out. Well, what we heard is fewer politicians in the parade. Yes. Well, yes. Okay, yes. Dave. Um, I may be alone in this, but I think this was true of the Royals parade in 2015 and this parade. The speeches at the end are kind of anticlimactic. You know, yeah. you go through this parade, people are all excited, and then they get on the stage, it's very haphazard who speaks, who doesn't. Uh, I believe Travis Kelsey said some things that maybe tender ears should not have heard, and uh, there may be some concerns in that, that uh, 
department. So maybe they could think a little bit harder about some more organization to the podium once they get down there. Actually, my 16-year-old daughter was there, was actually thrilled to hear Mike Parson, the governor of Missouri, and mm. Jackson County Executive Frank White speak. And that was the highlight for her she on needs her counsel. Instagram She account. needs real counsel. Spoken like the daughter of a, of a, a news okay. talk show host here. Maybe next time they could put the names of the players on the buses so that yeah. the fans oh, okay. knew who was going by. With the players wearing the big goggles, it was really tell, hard to tell Mahomes yeah. from Kelsey from anybody else. I yeah. All right. Well, President Trump got a lot of ribbing this week for his tweet that congratulated the Chiefs for representing the great state of Kansas so very well. Right. The great state of Kansas. Great state, state of Kansas. <laughs> Can you find Kansas City on this map? Um, no, that's, that's Florida. Kansas City is in Kansas, and it is also in Missouri. It's like the difference between right. the New York Giants. I mean, the Giants are, people call them the New York Giants, but they're in New Jersey. Right. right. Did the president, though, do anything differently than so many entertainers and performers do who come to Kansas City and say from the Sprint Center stage, I love you, Kansas can? Well, first of all, I think it's different being a performer versus the president in terms of yes. what you're expecting. But I think that, you know, a lot of people do this. It just, it hurt a lot of fans to see that from the president. Well, and this is yet one more reason why the man probably needs someone else to check his Twitter account before he <laughs> lets loose. Yeah, but, I mean, this is just such a common mistake. I really thought way too much was made right, of it. Right. That's exactly right. It happens all the time yeah. with entertainers, as you know, and others. So normally you wouldn't probably react, just laugh it off. However, the president of the United States has a habit of making mistakes like this, and it's, so it's exacerbated in that sense. <laughs> he probably increased votes in Kansas because they want to be viewed of as part of this uh, Super Bowl winning Chiefs team, too, though, well, Steve, right? Th that's possible, but I, I would agree that he was a little bit embarrassed here. That was, that's, a, that's a juvenile mistake that you, you got to get right when it comes to the politics of Missouri and Kansas. By the way, last week we asked, will the Chiefs go to the White House? Now an official invitation. The way uh, your Super Bowl champions are coming, I think next week or soon, very soon, and they, every one of them want to be here. And the coach loves us. The coach is great, Andy Reid, and uh, every one of them want to be here. Is it going to be next week? And will all the team go, as the president points out? Well, I I've heard that it's happening next week, but I don't know any details as to what day it is. I know that. Uh, Andy Reid has said it would be a tremendous honor to attend. Other players, like Tyron Matthew, he said, I represent the Chiefs, so he alluded to the fact that he would be going. <laughs> but there were a couple other players who said, I don't really know about this. They were unsure. So it will be interesting to see if the whole team shows up. Will there be people burning the shirts, though, uh, Mary, if some players don't go and saying, I don't like them anymore? You know, it depends on how much someone stands out, if we have a Colin Kaepernick in our midst or not. I don't know. I have a feeling that Andy Reid will control his team somewhat. They've been very good, and the Chiefs organization is as well, frankly, about managing messaging around a lot of these social mm -hmm. issues. Almost, you could argue, maybe to a fault, but, you know, and let, let's let the players speak. We'll see. While we were celebrating our Super Bowl winning Chiefs, one of the biggest stories nationally was chaos in Iowa. There are still so many questions about what happened in Iowa. The only results from the Iowa caucus at this hour are chaos and confusion. How could it take so long to get an election result? And is what happened in Iowa ringing any alarm bells as Kansas and Missouri get ready to vote? Kansas has announced it's abandoning the caucus system this year, joining Missouri in hosting a primary election. So does that prevent such an issue from happening here, Steve? Well, you hope it prevents that from happening, but I'll just point out, Nick, that Kansas is going to go to a rank uh, voting method of, of casting ballots this time. That's going to complicate things, and voters are going to have a hard time wrapping their their arms around that. Iowa had a three-tiered process, and that thing blew up in its face, so it may well in Kansas. As Steve Moore points out, Kansas is doing something in May that they've never done before. In that Democratic primary, they've adopted what, as Steve mentioned, was ranked choice voting, where you pick multiple candidates, not just one. And to ease the confusion, there are now elaborate explainer videos of how it all works. Ranked choice voting allows you to rank your favorite candidates instead of choosing just one. To vote, you rank your favorite candidate as number one, then your second favorite as number two, and so on. If your first choice candidate has limited support, your next choice will be counted to ensure your vote is not wasted. 
That's a more complicated tally system. But, Couldn't that lead to delays, particularly as they've never done this before, Ken? Well, I think that the stakes are a little bit lower once you get to the Kansas primary. It's May 2nd. <laughs> you know, you'll have fewer candidates, so I think that that could shorten the, the time as well. Also, I'll point out, Iowa, part of their problem was this app they were using to report some of the results. There was some technological difficulties. So I think that it might take a little bit longer. It'll take people time to get used to this, but there will be fewer candidates in the mix. Yeah, I spoke with the Democratic Party in Kansas this week about this procedure and whether they have any concerns. Iowa is a version of ranked choice voting at its caucuses, and that's what people are worried about. Kansas officials with the party told me that they do plan to release the ranked choice outcome, but they will also release at some point the raw vote totals, that is to say, who got the most first place, who got the most second place. So like Iowa, you could get two results, one winner after ranked choice mm -hmm. votes are counted, and another with the raw totals in which a candidate gets the most out of the box. Now, Kat is exactly right. By the time uh, Kansas votes, by the way, there's write-in as well. Um, Which but, is in May, and yes. they're one of the last May 10 second. states. Yes. Yep. May 2nd is the primary, but there's write-in during April. It, 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 they're going to send ballots to every registered Democrat. By the way, you have to be a registered Democrat to vote. But, but there is a chance that there will be some confusion, but there'll be a smaller field, more time to count, and Kansas isn't going first, Nick. That's the important thing, so the stakes aren't very high. Mary. Well, I, unfortunately, I mean, all the confusion. I love the little trainer video, kind of almost like Sesame Street. I mean, it's actually very well done. We didn't produce it, though, yes. <laughs> well, but it's very good, um, and it, it explains it quite well. But I think the average voter gets yeah. confused on these issues. Yeah. And unfortunately, we already saw this coming out of Iowa. It, it allows bad actors to sow con the confusion and try to, um, you know, put this veneer of, well, our elections aren't secure. And that, that is, we cannot have that. That's awful. And, and while, by the way, we always saw in Iowa and the complaint that it took so long to get an election result, just two years ago in Kansas, it took a week to find out who the Republican nominee was for governor between Chris Kobach and the sitting governor, uh, Jeff Collier. So that we're was familiar a, with it. a little bit of a different situation. That vote was just so close, Nick, just a handful of votes separating Chris Kobach from Jeff Collier. I think then having to wait to count the provisional ballots, that's what slowed that process down. Cat's right. What happened in Iowa was a technical kind of problem. And confusion, you're, here we are a week later, we don't really know who won. Okay. But several candidates can claim that they won. It's it's confusing for voters and maybe ultimately unsatisfying. Very, very, after five nope, months, I'm sorry, no this, time no. for you, Dave, yeah, because we are moving on. Because after five months of hearings and investigations, President Trump was acquitted this week, bringing an acrimonious impeachment trial to an end. How did your local senator vote? These articles should have never been sent to the Senate. They were not compelling. They were not overwhelming. They were not bipartisan. And most importantly, Mr. President, they were not necessary. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, not guilty. The House Democrats have given us the first purely partisan impeachment in our history. Mr. Hawley. Mr. Hawley, not guilty. The framers intended impeachment and removal to be reserved for rare and extreme situations. The alleged facts contained in the articles and presented by the impeachment managers do not rise to this level. Mr. Moran. Not. Mr. Moran, not guilty. I do not believe that removal from office is warranted, more especially during an election year. Mr. Roberts. Not Mr. Roberts, not guilty. Now, none of the four senators from Kansas or Missouri are up for re-election this year, but Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell said this week in every race where there were vulnerable Republicans, all of them are doing better today than they were before the impeachment trial took place. If that's the case, what does this mean for other races right here in our metro, from the Senate race in Kansas uh, to the race to try and oust Sharice Davids in the 3rd District, Steve? You know, I'm not sure there's a dramatic impact on those races, Nick. I think the partisans on each side are pretty well set in their camps. 
I don't see impeachment really looming as a mega issue when th this election pops up uh, seven, eight, ten months from now. Well, it got barely any media coverage thanks to the Super Bowl and the Iowa caucuses this week. Believe it or not, the first debate got underway in the crowded Republican primary for the Kansas United States Senate seat. Chris Kobach's campaign put out press releases saying he handily won that debate at the Kansas Republican Convention in Olathe. Was that also the view of those who watched the debate in the ballroom of Olathe's Embassy Suites Hotel? Well, okay. Pete Mundo said that that was his opinion, that he handily won, that his... Uh, and he was the moderator. Yeah, his debate skills were on full display, and it was a really strong showing. There were some people in the crowd who said, oh, I'd be nervous about Kobach going into it, but they left saying that they would probably vote for him. Could the next, though, United States senator from Kansas not even be in the race yet? And I'm not talking about our nation's Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, <laughs> but the man who for decades has unclogged your drains and garbage disposals. I'm talking about Bob Hamilton. Better call Bob. Bob Hamilton. Apparently, he just met with the National Republican Senatorial Committee to discuss his possible candidacy. Many people may have a hard time taking this seriously, but what does he bring to the race that the other candidates don't have, Dave? Well, he would argue a business background and uh, a conservative point of view and a new face. The other uh, candidates are all established politicians. If you want to drain the swamp, I guess calling a plumber is a good idea. Uh, but uh, I, there, you can also talk to Republicans who say two things. First, they don't think this is overwhelmingly serious. But second, there continues to be, I think everything, everybody we talked to after the debate said Chris Kobach did win, that he's a very skilled debater. And they're, they're freaked out that Kobach might well be the nominee, and so people are still looking around for another choice. You know, Bob, also, they've talked about his ability to potentially put some of his own money into the campaign, self-funding. <laughs> and then, you know, Better Call Bob is a very catchy uh, tagline. And, and sports stars effortlessly move from the athletics into the world of politics. Couldn't he be unclogging the drain in Washington, D.C. as a TV plumber? I kind of doubt it. I think someone coming from a business background that doesn't have quite the cachet of a, um, a sports person would have a harder route. It's a more uphill. Well, this was also the week of the State of the Union address. While most of the headline seems to focus on Nancy Pelosi tearing up a copy of the president's speech, there were quite a few local connections to the 80-minute primetime event. Our local congresswoman, Sharice Davids, escorted the president into the House chamber. Emmanuel Cleaver was a no-show and a surprising shout-out from the president for a local hospital and a local woman and her young child. In 2017, doctors at St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City delivered one of the earliest premature babies ever to survive. Born at just 21 weeks and six days and weighing less than a pound, Ellie Schneider was a born fighter. In the gallery, Ellie and Robin, we are glad to have you with us tonight. Mary, what was the purpose of well, they were, um, he was supposed to push for some funding for neonatal research, which is, I mean, that is wonderful. And then he also did kind of go into the political realm with um, a comment about abortion and late-term abortions. That was the point, that yeah. he wanted to emphasize yeah. his pro-life credentials, even in the State of the Union address, in, in a speech that was very, very political, Nick. And I'll point out that Stephen Dial, who used to be on the show, frequently Absolutely. did the story for KSHB in 2017 about that little girl who was at yeah. the State of the Union. Sharice Davids, by the way, was the person who was supposedly bringing the president to the Water, House chamber yeah. as the escort. What, what is the significance of that? If well, all? she said she planned to ask him about health care, so there's some politics involved in that. I'm sure there was not a big exchange between the two of them. Can I just say, Nick, that I actually worked in Washington when Ronald Reagan was the first president at the State of the Union to pick out someone from the crowd. It was actually the gentleman who jumped into the river after the crash in the Potomac. It has become the worst part of the State of the Union address. It, it's like, you know, this is your life. And uh, while all, you know, respect to the woman and her family and the little baby, of course, it, it's difficult to watch people used as props sometimes. Yeah. When you put a show like this together every week, you can't get to every major headline. What was the big local story we missed? With 23 murders around the metro, it's now official. It was Kansas City's deadliest January in a decade. A warning to Jackson County homeowners, get ready for another big rise in property assessments. If you thought last year was bad, the new county administrator says the next one will probably be worse for you. Was it a one-day virus? Unhappy with pay and working conditions, more than 300 Shawnee Mission School District teachers call in sick. 
More complaints over how the state of Missouri has awarded new marijuana dispensary licenses. A new wrinkle, some of the winners now selling their permits for big money to those who lost out. Pit bulls now welcome in Prairie Village. The city council joining a growing number of local cities repealing bans on the breed. And after 70 years, Kansas City's first name in meat is closing. McGonagall selling to an Iowa supermarket chain. All right, was it one of those stories, Kat Reed, or something completely different? I have to go with the assessments because I just think we still haven't resolved what happened this past year. There are people who paid in protest. We have lawsuits in the works. So just to f hear that and think, oh my gosh, we're going to go through all of this again. It's going to be rough. Mary. Um, well, this is not something we necessarily miss because it's actually about to happen as we um, tape on Friday morning. But the funeral of the Reverend Wallace Hartsfield is mm -hmm. about to begin. And he was just... He was a fierce advocate for the African American community here. I just, I deeply respected the man. Steve. Too many homicides, Nick. 18 so, so far in Kansas City, Missouri in 2020, fastest pace in five years. People don't want to acknowledge the story. They want to ignore it. I get it, but we've got to keep the focus on that issue and figure it out. Sometimes, though, when a story it just is every single week, yes. people get tired of they it. They get tired of it, and they want to tune it out, but our kids are killing each other. We've got to get on top of this story. Dave. Uh, Kansas House uh, is debating uh, putting an amendment about abortion on the ballot, uh, perhaps in August. If it fails, and many people think it will as we tape this, there will be an effort, uh, I'm told, to put it on in November. Uh, so the issue will not be dead, presumably, even if the House rejects it this time. Mm. There may not be the votes to put it on in November either, however, and we'll see once that happens, that contentious issue would one way or another be off the table in Topeka. And we will monitor that next week on this program. That is our Week in Review, keeping you up to date weekday mornings at 11 on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske. And for 41 Action News reporter Kat Reed, you can now go to bed. Nationally syndicated columnist for the Tribune News Service, Mary Sanchez and Dave Helling of your Kansas City West star. never sleeps. I Absolutely. Never sleep. All righty. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. <laughs>